It is Wednesday, January 4th, 2023, so it is the first Wednesday of 2023, and we're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're in Genesis chapter 31 tonight, so you may want to be grabbing a Bible and getting a Bible ready, getting with me and uh, meeting me in this passage. We'll have the text on the screen. Uh, but obviously it's a, it's a bigger chapter, so the, the text may be a little bit smaller here and there. But the Genesis 31, if you have it open in your lap or on your own device, that would be awesome. But we're glad that you've joined us tonight. We also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. We have about 45 minutes set aside for a Bible study. We're working our way through the book of Ephesians. And Aaron, one of our elders, is leading us through that class. I've enjoyed uh, being in that class. I've learned a lot, and I'm very thankful for that. And then we come together for worship also at 10.30. So from uh, 10.30 till about 11.30 is our worship assembly. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, we would love to hear from you. If you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, we would invite you to do that as well. We've uh, recently been able to, I don't know if you'd maybe say solidify the, the YouTube presence a little bit under the tag or the label at Four Lakes Church. And so instead of just some random string of letters and numbers, you can now find our videos uh, by uh, looking there on YouTube for at Four Lakes Church. And I think that'll make it a lot easier to share if you're interested in sharing anything with friends or family. And uh, that, by the way, matches our other social media addresses. We can also be found on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter by looking for uh, Four Lakes Church. And so we want to invite you to find us in those other places as well, although we're most, uh, most active on Facebook as opposed to the others. But again, if you have any questions, give me a call or send a text. Uh, the church number is 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. Uh, this past Sunday, we invited everybody to continue reading the Bible on a daily basis. If you're not doing that already, this would be a great time to be able to jump in right here at the beginning of a new year. So uh, we passed out a hard copy of a very good schedule for reading through the New Testament in a year, and that's in the cubby holes at church. I'll try to put the link where you can download that on your own and always have that available on your phone. I'll pr try to put that in the description of tonight's video if I can remember to do that. But if you need that link to be sent to you directly, if you're interested in following along, uh, let me know by sending a request or a message to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, and I'd be glad to send you uh, that link in that way. But a very good opportunity to read about a chapter a day through the New Testament. And it's uh, Monday through Friday, taking the weekends off or using Saturday and Sunday to catch up if you missed a day or two and get back on track. So let me know if you need any help with that. Uh, tonight we are back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings written by Moses, and we're now looking at the life of Jacob. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've moved on to Jacob. We've been looking at Jacob for a few weeks now. He pretty much tricked his brother by taking the birthright. Of course, there was a trade that was made, but there was some deception for him to actually get the blessing from his father, and that made Esau, his brother, very angry and uh, brought on his brother's wrath. His brother promised to kill him, at least do the best that he could to do that. And so uh, Jacob has fled to Haran, where he has picked up several wives, where he has prospered working for his father-in-law, uh, Laban. And tonight in Genesis 31, Jacob, after a number of years, about 20 years, I believe, he is finally ready to come home. So 20 years. And he now has four wives, a total of 12 children at this point, 11 boys and one girl. And so the family is certainly growing and he is ready to get out of there and uh, get out there on his own. By way of brief review, just bringing us up to speed on the chart again, Leah starts out with the first four sons, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Of course, he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Those were the two wives. He worked seven years for Rachel, but instead got Leah, had to work another seven years years to actually get Rachel. Uh, of course, he had her there in the middle of that 14 years, so they were together after the seven. So Leah and Rachel, Leah is the one who starts having children first. Well, obviously, if we can imagine being in that situation, that makes Rachel feel extremely left out since she is barren. She is unable to have children. And so she allows Jacob to go into her maid Bilhah, who subsequently then bears Dan and Naphtali. And that makes Leah worried about falling behind. And so she has Jacob go into her maid, Zilpah, who bears Gad and Asher. And so Leah then takes the lead again with Issachar, Zebulun, and the one daughter of the family, Dinah. 
And toward the end of Genesis 30, we have Rachel bearing Joseph, her firstborn, and that brings us to 11 sons and one daughter in this family of one husband and four wives. We could hardly imagine a situation like that, but a, a messed up family situation. And we'll get back to some of that dysfunction in tonight's class. Uh, I've left Benjamin on the chart, although he hasn't been born yet. I've kind of left him grayed out, kind of the light blue there. He's son number 12. So again, he has not yet been born, but we are heading in that direction. So I just don't want to forget about him. He is coming at some point in the future here. So he's on the chart. But let's jump into our text for tonight, Genesis chapter 31. The first paragraph is verses 1 through 16, and it all flows together. So we'll just uh, tackle the whole chunk here at the beginning. Genesis 31, verses 1 through 16. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father he has made all this wealth. Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field and said to them, I see your father's attitude, that it is not friendly toward me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. If he spoke thus, the speckled shall be your wages. Then all the flock brought forth speckled. And if he spoke thus, the striped shall be your wages. Then all the flock brought forth striped. Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. And it came about at the time when the flock were mating, that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. He said, Lift up now your eyes, and see that all the male goats which are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth." Rachel and Leah said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not reckoned by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Surely all the wealth which God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. You may remember from the last verse of Genesis chapter 30, and this is the value of having our Bibles open. We can easily look back there. But the, the last verse of the previous chapter, Jacob became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. And so we remember the whole thing with the genetics. Usually uh, sheep are they're normally solid white and goats are normally solid black or a dark brown. And occasionally we might have a black sheep or in some cases sheep and goats are striped and spotted or have little specks on them. And so Jacob suggested that he take the black sheep. So that's unusual. If there's any black sheep born, I'll take it. And then he would also be willing to take anything that's spotted or striped or speckled or any of that. And Laban would keep the solid color. So that would be just a vast majority of the flocks. And of course, it was common in those days, as we discussed last week, for shepherds to be paid with a percentage. So the shepherd may take 10%, 20% of the flock, whatever might be worked out. But of course, both of these men are schemers. And so they agree to this new plan, which seems to be foolproof. I mean, obviously, you can't adjust how these sheep are born, what color they are, and all of that. At least that was their idea. That's That was their understanding back then. But here we are moving into Genesis chapter 31. And Jacob's flocks are far outpacing Laban's. And notice the reaction of Laban's sons up there in verse 1. They see Jacob as stealing everything. So they see Jacob as taking away all of their father's flocks and all of his wealth, which of course really means they're concerned about what? They're his sons. And so the, Jacob is stealing their inheritance. That He's taking away all this stuff, the flocks and the wealth and anything that might have been passed down to them at some point. And so they're mad. They're really angry about this, that this guy has come in. He's been here 20 years. He's taken everything that belongs to our dad, and that really belongs to us. And so they're upset. And I think we can understand why they're feeling in this way. Uh, but we find in verse 2 
that they turn hostile toward Jacob. So it's not just feelings, but it, it's beginning to be expressed in various ways. They are, they are no longer outwardly friendly as they used to be, as they were at the beginning, but they're no longer friends. And Jacob senses this. Something is not right. It, it's very obvious that he is no longer welcome in this family. Well, in response, Jacob calls for Rachel and Leah, and they have a family meeting. And Jacob explains the situation. He lays it out. It's getting tense around here. Uh, you know that I've served your father faithfully, but your father has done nothing but cheat me, even changing my wages 10 times through the years. And I think we have an indication of this. There is some inconsistency between what he says his wages would be here as opposed to the previous chapter. And I think that's part of the way that Laban was messing with this plan. He was even changing this plan about the speckled and spotted, spotted and mottled and striped and, and all of that. He's already uh, abusing this agreement that they had. Um, but Jacob also points out in his talk with Rachel and Leah that God has made up for this. And Jacob now explains that God was behind the whole spotted and speckled and all that kind of thing. And this is where we learn that there really wasn't some kind of genetic secret to this. But instead, whatever agreement they made, God would bless Jacob along the way. Whatever you agree to, God is going to make it right, and he did. And it's so dramatic, in fact, that Jacob says in verse 9, Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. So once they made that agreement that Jacob would take any spotted or striped offspring, everything from that point on was spotted or striped. That'd be an amazing thing, wouldn't it? If you're used to having white sheep and you made the agreement with this guy and then suddenly after the agreement, everything from here on out is spotted and striped, it's, it's an obvious statement from God. And so we find here this was uh, not just to reward and enrich Jacob, it was also intended as a sign. This prospering would prove to Jacob that God was blessing him. It was to be incredibly obvious that, that God had seen what Laban had been doing to him all along and that God was empathetic to Jacob's situation here. Well, God then identifies himself as the God of Bethel. That goes back to that vision with the angels going up and down the, the ladder or the stairway into heaven. And God now tells Jacob to leave Haran and to go back home to the land of his birth. Well, at this point, Rachel and Leah, they want to know, well, what about us? Do we have a place here in our father's house anymore, or do we go with you? And their concern is that their own father now views them as foreigners. So, and they see this. They've been sold by their own father, and their father has consumed their purchase price. So basically, they see that their father has sold them into slavery. And now he has nothing to show for it. As I understand it, often there would be that kind of dowry that would be saved up and put aside. And maybe it would be given back to the bride so that she would have something of her own as she started that new uh, family of her own. But here they see their, their father has blown through that money. There is nothing left. He's used that for his own survival. There is nothing left to show for it. And at the end, these two women, they seem to recognize that the wealth God has taken away from their father really belongs to them. And so they agree with Jacob and they tell him to do whatever God has told him to do, which is to leave. And that's a very wise decision on their point to see the, uh, the wisdom of their husband's spiritual leadership. He's been talking with God. This is the message that was given. And so their response is basically, yes, we're going to do whatever you uh, would have us to do. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 31, verses 17 through 24. Genesis chapter 31, verses 17 through 24. Then Jacob arose and put his children and his wives upon camels. And he drove away all his livestock and all his property which he had gathered, his acquired livestock which he had gathered in Padan Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. When Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he was fleeing. So he fled with all that he had, and he arose and crossed the Euphrates River and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. When it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, then he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him a distance of seven days' journey. And he overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream in the night and said to him, Be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. It's interesting to me how Jacob decides to leave in secret, isn't it? He doesn't ask Laban's permission here, 
but he gets his wives on board, he packs up, and he is out of there. Kind of wonder why. Well, I think we know why, don't we? Jacob knows what kind of man he's dealing with here. And so he leaves in secret without giving his father-in-law any heads up whatsoever. No chance to say goodbye, yeah, but also no chance to keep this from happening. No chance to deceive him one last time. He just gets out of there. And this is a huge move. As we've learned in this chapter, in the previous chapter, he has acquired a vast majority, vast quantities of livestock, a lot of property. And, you know, I think of me leaving on a camping trip. I've got a checklist of gear and supplies that I keep on my phone, depending on what it is. Is it camping? Is it hiking? Is it kayaking? It all depends, doesn't it, as to what gear we're going to bring, exactly what we're going to need, how many days, how much food will we need, and that kind of thing. And, and that's for me, and that's just for one person. And it takes me some time to get out the door to go on a big trip like that. But we can hardly even imagine what it would be like to move a family of four wives 12 children, livestock, as well as a number of servants, both male and female. This, this is just a huge move, a huge uh, logistical nightmare, but he gets it done. In verse 19, we're told that on the way out, Rachel steals her father's household idols on the way out the door. Um, there's a chance she was just taking these for the gold or the other precious metals. That's maybe a part of it here, financial motivation. But there's also a chance that Rachel is still somewhat pagan, that she is still somewhat superstitious, that she kind of hates to leave that, and she knows it's going to be different on the road uh, with her husband. You remember the issue with the mandrakes, that incident with the mandrakes uh, back in chapter 30 in last week's study. You know, there was some superstition involved in mandrakes, and so she was really into getting those mandrakes. Well, Rachel has made some huge progress spiritually through the years, but she's not maybe quite all the way on board with the God of Jacob quite yet. She's leaning in that direction. Good things are happening, uh, but she does have some issues. And we'll get back to this in just a moment. But for now, uh, Jacob makes some huge progress heading toward home, traveling with this huge caravan on his way back to uh, hopefully be reunited with Isaac, his father. In verse 22, we find that it takes uh, three days for Laban to find out that Jacob has fled. Remember back in verse 19, Laban had gone out to shear his flock, and so he had traveled to his flock somewhere out in the wilderness to do some shearing, or at least to be there for the process. And I don't know whether any of you have actually seen sheep being sheared. I would highly recommend it. Uh, the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival is held at the Jefferson County Fairgrounds on the second weekend of every September. It is so interesting. So Jefferson, of course, maybe 40, 45 minutes straight east of Madison, kind of halfway between Madison and Milwaukee. I would highly recommend checking that out, the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival every September. And I've told you before, my favorite event is the Crook and Whistle Nationals, this nationwide competition between shepherds and their sheepdogs. Just fascinating to see those men and women control the, the dogs which drive the sheep. I don't know if that's the proper name for it, but just an amazing process to behold. I love the lamb barn. I have a whole uh, section in one of the large barns with the newborn lambs, like born 12 hours previous to when you're looking at them. And a lot to learn with that. Uh, several barns full of uh, wool and homemade uh, woolen items and thread and yarn. Uh, kind of a nightmare on those two barns for me, but I do walk through just quickly to see what's up in there. But uh, one of my favorite parts of it, it, kind of a close second to the Crook and Whistle Nationals, would be the sheep shearing demonstration. And there are families that travel all around the uh, north and the upper Midwest just to shear sheep. That's their job. That's what they do for a living. So they got the trailer, they throw the plywood out there on the ground, and they have this uh, anointed day <laughs> where certain uh, farmers would bring all their sheep to this spot, and they would just go from farm to farm to farm to farm all year long. It's really not much of a seasonal thing. It used to be, but uh, not so much these days, at least as this last guy this year was uh, explaining it. But as I remember it, it, it took about 90 seconds to shear a full-grown sheep. I had no idea it would be that fast, uh, but huge quantities of wool. I wouldn't swear to it, but as I remembered, it was like a like a 55 gallon drum liner bag that they would just fill up with the the wool that was coming off of these sheep. Just an amazing process. So having seen this in person, I think I can understand why a head of household like Laban would want to be there for that. That's a huge event if you're a shepherd, if you own large numbers of sheep. To, you know, to make sure everything goes smoothly. 
uh, to make sure that the wool getting collected is getting collected properly and honestly, that they're getting the right percentage of it if, in return for their labor and doing the shearing and so on. But it takes him three days, is my point, to find out that Jacob has left. He's been out there working the farm, and it takes him a while before he realizes this. And we can't help but think, well, this is why Jacob left at this time. Um, he knows this, and he knows it's going to be a little while, and he can have at least a little bit of a head start. Well, Laban, when he hears, is obviously not happy about this, and so he chases Jacob down. Jacob has this three-day head start. Laban catches up to him on the seventh day, and I'm guessing he is absolutely furious about this. Just imagine what this man is thinking. All that he's done, all the deception and cheating, and he's a, a selfish man, hungry for the, the finances and all this. He's got to be just absolutely uh, irate about Jacob getting away or, oh, along with his children and grandchildren and uh, vast quantities of flocks and all of this. And so to try to calm him down a little bit, it seems, God appears to Laban in the night, the night before he catches up, and basically tells him to be careful. Do not speak to Jacob either good or bad. And I would take this, if I could uh, paraphrase this, I, I would have God saying here basically, be calm. Be calm. Don't do anything rash. Don't say anything good or bad. Don't fly off the handle. Nothing good can come from that. Don't just don't speak anything good or bad. Be calm. And I've told you before, be calm is some of the best advice that my grandfather, Tommy Exum, ever gave to me. Uh, through the years, uh, he would explain that whatever you're facing in life, just life in general, but specifically or especially in the church, he would say no good ever comes from flying off the handle. If you're calm in a situation, you can usually figure things out. And so whenever he would write me, um, he would often, somewhere in the letter or on the postcard, he would include the words, keep calm. And he always typed, like in an old manual typewriter or maybe like the IBM Selectric 2, one of those. I mean, he would always type those letters out. And it would always be in all capital letters with several uh, exclamation points. <laughs> and I always laughed at that, of course. It didn't seem very calm to be telling somebody to keep calm with all capital letters and multiple exclamation points. But that's how important it was to him. His, his advice was, above all things, as you're doing your work for the Lord and his church, keep calm. Uh, don't fly off the handle. Don't get too, uh, you know, bent out of shape over things, but, but keep yourself under control, we might say. So I uh, kind of thought that was interesting. And uh, years ago, the city clerk um, got a real nice note explaining, it came from an employee of the city, from the city's accounting department who had been assigned to work at the polling place I was running. And um, I think it was the huge presidential election back in 2020. So th thousands of voters, uh, the press, they were there, observers were there, mo lawyers, multiple wards coming together. There was COVID, um, mask barriers, new poll workers because a lot of our older workers couldn't work anymore. So we had like a brand new crew of like 55 people. Uh, the polling place had been changed. So voters were mad. They didn't know where they were going. The National Guard was there to help. And this woman wrote to the city clerk and, and her compliment was basically about how calm Baxter seemed to be. She couldn't believe I wasn't panicking. And, uh, but we got it done efficiently and accurately. And when the city clerk passed that along to me, uh, I immediately thought of my grandfather. No matter what happens, no matter what kind of job you have or situation we're facing with people, there is a huge benefit in just keeping calm and thinking through that situation. And that seems to be God's advice to Laban. I know you're mad, but don't do anything rash here. Do not say or do anything that you might regret. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 31 verses 25 through 35. Genesis 31 verses 25 through 35. Laban caught up with Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen camped in the hill country of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done by deceiving me and carrying away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with joy and with songs, with timbrel and with lyre? And did you not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do to you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. 
Now you have indeed gone away because you long greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Then Jacob replied to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maids, but he did not find them. Then when he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent, now Rachel had taken the household items and put them in the camel's saddle, and she sat on them. And Laban felt through all the tent, but did not find them. She said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household idols. Laban, therefore, catches up to Jacob, and his question is, what have you done? He sees that Jacob has deceived him. What right does this guy have to be upset about being deceived? We have, you know, Laban is the one who deceived Jacob into working seven years extra for uh, the, well, seven years for the wrong woman, and then another seven years for the right woman. But the deceiver is upset about being deceived by another deceiver, isn't he? He accuses Jacob of taking his daughters away like captives of the sword. That's not exactly how it really happened, was it? That's not exactly how Jacob left. He doesn't know this, um, but they were not captives. And so he's being as dramatic as possible here. And not only that, notice how Laban says he wishes he could have sent Jacob away. You know, I wish I could have sent you away with a big party with joy and songs. You know, we would have played instruments out of the, the timbrel and the lyre. You know, if Jacob had said, hey, I'd like to leave with your daughters and most of your flocks, do we really think Laban would have just sent him off with a party? Not exactly. You know, under no circumstances would he have actually done that. He would have done anything possible to prevent Jacob from leaving. But that's the way he frames it in this confrontation. Uh, nevertheless, now that it has happened, Laban tells Jacob about his dream and God's warning. He seems resigned to let this happen. There's really not much he can do to, to bring them back at this point. He's really outnumbered. But his concern is, you know, why'd you steal my gods? You know, on top of everything, why, why'd you have to steal my gods? And I think right there is a pretty good indication that Laban is not quite as God-fearing as we might have imagined. I think we pointed this out two or three weeks ago. Uh, Laban doesn't seem to be as religious now as he was back when Abraham's servant showed up looking for a wife uh, for Isaac. Back then, you may remember the family, I think, seemed to kind of recognize God's role in that process. Like, blessed are you coming from the Lord or something like that. Just paraphrasing there. But not much the second time. The second time they just kind of ate together and got on with business, no reference to God, uh, many years later. And so now, even 20 years after that, Laban is mad that somebody stole his gods. Um, by the way, if your god can be stolen, that's probably not a god you need to be worshiping. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the concern here. You stole my gods. Uh, and Jacob, not knowing that Rachel has stolen the idols, explains that uh, he left in fear Whoever's found with those gods will not be allowed to live. Feel free to search through our stuff. You can take whatever's yours. So Laban then searches the tents, doesn't find anything. And unbeknownst to Jacob, Rachel has taken the idols, his favorite wife, and she's hidden them in the camel's saddle. And she sat on that. And so her dad comes in, tearing the place apart, and she says she can't get up because the manner of women is upon her. And so her dad leaves her alone and searches the, the rest of the tent, but leaves without finding the household idols. What a messed up family. I, I keep saying that, but uh, that just a messed up family situation. All kinds of dysfunction going on here. The deceiver has now been deceived by the deceiver's deceptive wife, who is also the deceiver's daughter. Everything is wrong about this. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 31, verses 36 through 42. Genesis 31, 36 through 42. Then Jacob became angry and contended with Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, What is my transgression? And what is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Though you have felt through all my goods, what have you found of all your household goods? See it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks, that which was torn of beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. You required it of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. 
Thus I was. By day the heat consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock. And you changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been for me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, so he rendered judgment last night. So Jacob now turns the tables, doesn't he? Laban is the one who showed up angry, and now Jacob is the one who is angry for good reason. Uh, this is like the uh, annual airing of grievances, isn't it? At the uh, annual Festivus celebration. Uh, Festivus, by the way, has now been added to my computer spell check dictionary. I'm a little bit disappointed it wasn't there in the first place, but I had to correct that. Uh, but now Jacob is angry. Basically, why have you chased me? Why are you treating me like a criminal? Why have you searched all my stuff? And then he lays it out. And this is where we find Jacob has been there 20 years. So seven for Leah, seven more for Rachel, apparently six more years beyond the original for the flocks. And uh, in that time, he's been a hard worker. I haven't slept. I've been out in the cold and the rain. I've, I've done everything you've asked me to do. Uh, and in this time, Laban's flocks have flourished. In fact, there weren't even any miscarriages among the flocks. That was miraculous. I mean, that's not a normal thing. Beyond this, Jacob has been covering Laban's losses. So if something got killed by a predator or taken by a thief, uh, Jacob covered it out of his own allowance. I've worked hard night, day, rain, shine for your daughters, for your flocks. And on top of this, you've messed with my wages 10 times. You've just been changing stuff left and right. Uh, but at the end, though, Jacob knows and lets Laban know that God has been taking care of him. In fact, if it weren't for God, uh, Jacob would have been leaving empty-handed. As it is, though, due to God's blessings, Jacob is now an incredibly wealthy man. And the reason is God has seen Laban's dishonesty, and God has blessed Jacob because of what he has very patiently endured. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Genesis 31, verses 43 through 55. Genesis 31, 43 through 55. The last paragraph here. Then Laban replied to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, and the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters, or to their children whom they have borne? So now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. Then Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Jacob said to his kinsmen, Gather stones. So they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Now Laban called it Jagar Sadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore it was named Galid. And Mizpah, for he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from uh, one from the other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take wives beside my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold the pillar which I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass this heap to do you for harm. And you will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his kinsmen to the meal, and they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. Early in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his sons and his daughters, and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. You know, to me, it really seems like Laban really truly wants to do something terrible. He is on the edge of just doing a massacre here. He's angry that Jacob has left. He, he's angry that his daughters are gone. He's angry that he's lost all of his stuff. But in the opening verses here, he realizes, as he looks around during this confrontation, everything here, the daughters, the children, the flocks, is basically mine. So what can I do? And it's not like he can go to war with Jacob. And, and so instead, he proposes a covenant, this agreement, and that's what they do. It's almost like, uh, wasn't it Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, who chased down uh, Isaac way back when? I have to look that up again, but I think he also was in no position to ask for an agreement, but uh, asked for one anyway. And so that's what they do. They, they set up this uh, stone as a pillar. They, they eat together this act of fellowship. They call on God to be a witness between them. If Jacob ever mistreats Laban's daughters... If he ever marries other women, even though Laban might not see it, God will see it. And they agree that since the pillar is between them, neither one will pass by that pillar intending to do harm to the other. And that pillar will kind of serve as a reminder of that. So it's kind of a neat way to do that. 
Um, Jacob then offers a sacrifice. They eat this meal. They spend the night together on the mountain. They get up. Everybody kisses. And uh, Laban heads back toward home. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis chapter 31. So Jacob is now ready to continue his journey back home to see his father Isaac and to see whether he gets murdered by his uh, brother Esau. Um, so he's got more stuff in his mind than his father-in-law chasing him down. He's really not looking forward to the terrible things that may happen when he shows up at home. Uh, in terms of practical application, I would just remind us of what Laban lost. Back when Jacob first showed up at Laban's place looking for a wife, Laban was the guy with the power, wasn't he? He was the future father-in-law. He had the power of saying yes or no. And Jacob was basically some young guy on the run for his life hundreds of miles away from home. He had no bargaining power. He had no riches or wealth or power at that time. But over time, Laban revealed himself as being both evil and deceptive. And God could see that. And God is a God of justice. Over time, then, God fixes this situation. He doesn't fix it immediately. Um, Jacob has some learning to do, and this was a learning and maturing experience for Jacob, but God does fix it ultimately, and God makes things right, uh, even when Jacob didn't have the power to make this right on his own. But Jacob was patient. Um, so think about what uh, Laban loses here. He loses his daughters. He loses his grandchildren. He loses many of his flocks and many of his servants. You know, ultimately, it is very, very dangerous to mistreat God's people, which is what Laban has tried to do consistently over the past 20 years. So in terms of a practical application, do not be like Laban. Don't always be out there trying to cheat and deceive people and pull one over on people, because ultimately we know that God will settle that score in the end. Think of the book of Revelation. And the situation there, John the Apostle writing that book and the persecution that was happening under the Roman Empire. And, you know, the, the basic theme of the book of Revelation is God wins. It doesn't look like it at the time. Certainly not when the book of Revelation was written. It did not look like God was winning. Um, you know, many years ago, I remember taking some history class where they had like a, an animated map of the expansion of the Roman Empire. You know how the map will kind of like a little blob and it starts out here in Italy and then it grows and it shrinks and grows and gets big. And finally, it's like this huge empire spreading all over the Mediterranean world. And just a few years after John writes the book of Revelation, that map starts shrinking down until the Roman Empire vanishes into nothing. And that's pretty much what happens to Laban in this chapter. Next week, we hope to come back together to look at chapter 32. We're going to find out what happens next. And with that, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. And then after class, we plan on coming together for worship at 1030. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know that even in a far-off land, you could see Jacob being taken advantage of so terribly by Laban, and you found a way to start to make things right. We recognize tonight, therefore, that you are a God both of love and justice. You are a God who sees and you understand. You feel what we're feeling when we're abused and lonely. Tonight, we acknowledge that you see us. You also see how we treat other people. You know our motives. You know how we're thinking. You know what's in our hearts. You see how others treat us. And so tonight, we ask for your continued mercy. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.